Welcome. Thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your morning to be here and uh, join in this conversation. Um, you know, first of all, I, I, I want to say we're really excited to be part of the Qualcomm program. And uh, th what, what Brian just presented there is probably the most clear view, I think, of the future of, of AR and XR that I've, I've heard in a while. So that was awesome. Um, so just a little background on, uh, on Scope AR. So we're one of the uh, founders of augmented reality for industrial applications. Uh, we've been around since uh, 2012. So launched our first products uh, about 2015, uh, primarily focused on kind of the two use cases that you sort of see here. Um, one around remote assistance, the other one around guided instructions. So uh, we developed a software that makes it super easy for organizations to build their own, uh, you know, augmented reality, rich animated types of instructions, and then brought those together into kind of a joint experience. So we've we've been around for a number of years. We supported, um, you know, all sorts of different types of of hardware uh, over that time. Uh, devices that are here today, uh, like the Hololens and and Realware. Um, and in the past, even some devices that, are, that aren't around anymore. So we, we do have a lot of uh, perspective and experience in understanding that interaction between software uh, and hardware and a lot of the considerations that, that customers have to think about uh, when looking at using or, or applying augmented reality for industry. Um, and, and that's really what this panel is here to, to talk about and, and share some of the insights that they've gone through so that as you're looking at this as something that you're going to embark on in terms of a, of a journey moving forward. Hopefully you can learn from experiences of people that have gone through this. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, and, and so first of all, I'd actually like everybody to maybe just take two or three minutes to introduce themselves, um, you know, who they work for, uh, their role, and, and also just, just a comment on uh, where you are sort of in that, in that customer journey, in that journey, I guess. And, and as a uh, chief customer officer, I always look at it as a customer journey, but in that journey in terms of, you know, is this something that you're kind of early days on, uh, that you'd say that you've, you know, um, uh, been in, or you're in a pilot stage or, or are you in kind of full production? So, um, why don't we just go down the line and, uh, and start with that? Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Shyam Alipurthi. Uh, I work as a principal software engineer at Warma Technologies. Uh, my current role is to uh, design, develop, and architect some highly scalable cloud-native solutions uh, for across the uh, business units of Walmart. That's, that's my current role. But prior to that, I was wor working on building the mixed reality applications for HoloLens, uh, as well as uh, I played a key role in evaluating the vendor partners uh, providing technologies in the wearable space and also in integrating them with the uh, Walmart's core networks uh, systems and also the cloud providers that we support. Um, I think the other question that you had was uh, in the customer journey, I would say it's, uh, it depends on which business unit of Walmart are we talking about. So there are some business units, if you're talking about the store operations, yes, uh, we are all already in production and they are using this uh, on a day-to-day -day basis for some of the training activities, but whereas some other initiatives, we are still at the pilot stage. So it's it's a mix of it. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Maria Sorensen. I am with Mortensen. Mortensen is a family-owned construction company. We have over 5,000 team members, um, seven different industry-specific operating groups, including commercial buildings, federal, um, solar, wind, high voltage projects. Um, I'm mostly responsible for like anything that relates to virtual design and construction, help um, plan any type of prefabrication opportunity, and of course use a lot of augmented and uh, virtual um, reality type, types of technologies to help our customers to visualize design um, we have used augmented reality for installation. Also, we have done quite a few projects to uh, use it for quality control and maintenance as well. Good morning. My name is Mike Baca. I'm director of mobility solutions and edge solutions at Amerisource Bergen. Um, Amerisource Bergen, I like to say, is probably the largest company you've never heard of. Um, we're a Fortune 10 company um, in the healthcare services and supply chain space. So we're responsible for getting pharmaceuticals from the manufacturers to the patient 
and we deal with all the stakeholders along the way, such as the manufacturers, uh, payers, hospitals, pharmacies, providers, and ultimately the patient as well. Um, so my job, um, I've been in sort of this role for about five or six years, but mostly focused on mobile solutions and, and building up an internal mobile um, center of excellence. Um, but we've been sort of flirting on the edge, hence the edge solution part of my title now, um, getting into voice, getting into AI, getting into uh, VR, AR as well. So we've been sitting on the fence on the VR side of things for quite some time. I remember coming to this show uh, a few years back, and I would say there's maybe a third or a quarter of the folks that are in the room now. So this space has really grown. It's very exciting. Um, but we've taken our first baby step into this. So um, my, my comments are going to be kind of coming from a novice in this area, but um, we've kind of uh, got to the point now where we're doing a small pilot uh, for VR training within uh, our warehouses, our, our distribution centers. Thank you. I'm Shelley Peterson. I work for Lockheed Martin as the principal investigator for augmented reality and mixed reality. Um, so support that across our four business areas, which are Lockheed Martin Aeronautics, uh, Missiles and Fire Control, Rotary Mission Systems in Space. And I also work uh, directly for space as the principal investigator for AR and MR, um, enabling the teams to build spacecraft with AR. Um, at the moment, we have AR across a number of programs on the shop floor um, in actual spacecraft manufacturing activities. Awesome, thank you. So, you know, a really, really diverse uh, kind of group here from building spacecrafts to Walmart construction, um, uh, medical um, supply chain, so, and, and different levels of experience. And I mean, that's, that's really what you find at a show like this that's growing, is that you have people that um, are really understanding. I think everyone here understands that AR is gonna play a role in what we do moving forward in one way or another. It's just identifying exactly where you're gonna start with that. And the one thing that, that you know, I'm I'm always talking about is the fact that it's not which device are you going to select or which software you're going to select. It's really which one are you going to select first. Like, what is the right use case? It's not like everybody has one cell phone in an organization and that's it. Um, there's all sorts of varieties of different types of hardware and technology that we use in an organization. And as we move forward, it's going to be the same thing from AR. Which types of uh, applications and software you're going to use and which types of devices uh, based on the use case that you're in. And, and really, that, that becomes a, a really big top of, of conversation of how you do that. So what we're going to do is go through a little bit of a kind of a, a journey of understanding a few different things. One is when these uh, organizations and, and our panelists started to, you know, look at AR, or VR, or XR, you know, what were some of the challenges that they had to um, kind of consider when looking at the application of software onto the various hardware devices. Um, then we'll talk about actually maybe some of their use cases, probably some that work, maybe some that didn't. Um, and then talk about, okay, now that you've you know identified those challenges, you've found some good use cases, how did you actually do that? Um, so maybe we'll do reverse order uh, this time, starting starting with Shelly. Um, you know, when you're looking at the various uh, software or applications that you wanted to um, to apply, and you 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 would identify different hardwares that you were going to use to do that. What were some of the challenges? Whether it's you know things like uh, field of view or safety or battery or IT um, that maybe surprised you that that you can you know share with the uh, share with the audience. And and again, this is for people to maybe be able to learn from the experiences that that this group has had. You know, one of the things that we found was that really the field of view wasn't that big of an issue for the types of use cases that we had. Um, part of that was the way that we selected the use cases, but um, when you when you look at um, the process for the spacecraft manufacturing, um, for the traditional method, um, the time that it takes to uh, work with that traditional method and interpret that data when you give them a tool that's as powerful as AR, where you have content overlaid, um, it really changes the way they work. They don't mind the field of view. Um, in the early days, I asked one of the technicians, I said, what do you think about the field of view? Because we had heard that it was um, something to take into consideration. And the technician said, what do you mean the field of view? Um, I can walk across the room to see content in the traditional method 
or I can move my head a couple of degrees with AR. And it's much easier for me to move my head a couple of degrees than walk back and forth to uh, the traditional products all day long. So um, they didn't see field of view as that much of an issue. Um, now there are times where um, we have teams that want to work at a desktop level for um, assembly of uh, mechanisms, and we've avoided desktop uh, wearable AR scenarios for that reason because the field of view requires them to you know, tuck their chin and look down in order to see the content. Um, those scenarios may not be the best for that type of hardware, um, but the field of view is increasing um, over time with the devices, so we're not too worried about that. Um, with the battery life, originally it wasn't an issue for us because the types of use cases that we targeted in the early stages, um, they would obtain the information within minutes and be able to work very efficiently. Um, now we're seeing use cases where they could have a need to have the device on all day long. So uh, we were very cautious in picking the right scenarios so that we have uh, the appropriate ROI where it makes sense to have devices on charge while they're using other devices. So a lot of it is in what use cases you choose um, paired with the technology that's available at the time. In our situation, our question was much more fundamental than the, the software or the hardware used in the particular specifications of each. Um, we, our barrier was convincing the stakeholders that this was a worthwhile pursuit. Um, that virtual reality had some merit to it. And and what actually helped us out, um, I came to the last uh, show of this uh, a year ago and brought some business stakeholders with me um, so they could catch some of the excitement that, that I caught by being here. And uh, frankly, we were actually excited by the Walmart story of using uh, virtual reality for training. And that's the one sort of uh, application that stuck with my stakeholders. Of all the things we could do in our distribution centers, if we could uh, improve the efficiency of our warehouse workers by 1%, multiply that by the number of hours worked across all our distribution centers, that was a tremendous ROI. That was a tremendous payback. So we got a little bit of money this year to actually pursue this. And um, our, our question early on was, okay, do we want to, um, kind of bring a partner in and have them do a pilot, uh, which was a little bit pricey for the budget we had. Do we want to um, train some of our developers on a, a platform like Unity 3D uh, to develop a custom, you know, 100% digital world? Um, or did we want to kind of do a first step to gauge the effectiveness? And we, we chose the first step, gauge the effectiveness. And uh, our pilot is consisted of uh, 360 immersive videos and photos uh, stitched together on a do-it-yourself uh, VR platform. Um, so we're in the midst of doing that right now. In fact, I have the guy working on it, the lead on it here in the room. Uh, he's supposed to be actually working on the project, but he came along to the conference. So hopefully he'll pick up some tips here. But um, So for us, it was all about not necessarily a hardware software. That will come next. That will come in the next phase. This first phase was all about, is it a worthwhile pursuit? And how can we measure this to see if it's worth investing further in the future? And, and I think you bring up a, a really excellent point there. I mean, it's 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 so important to make sure that you have the use case that says these are the things that we can measure. Here's the value that we're going to create. We're going to save time. We're going to save money. We're going to improve efficiency. We're going to be able to verify work that's being done. We're going to be able to um, ensure that new workers have best practices in front of them. Um, and it's something that's measurable. And and that is, you know, when you're looking at use cases, um, and, and I talk about use cases a lot because there's all sorts of, um, uh, you know, starting points that you can try, that you can kick tires, that you can test it out, but without having that, that fundament, fundamental piece of why and how you're going to measure it, um, you'll never go any further than, than this initial first step. So um, yeah, that, that's, that's an excellent point. Uh, Maria, I'm curious in terms of, from the construction industry, um, is there considerations in terms of the UI from things like safety perspective um, or, or the UX? How, how, do you, how do you consider that? Um, so yeah, there is a lot of challenges, and like you said, there is a different tool for different applications. I mean, VR has been around for a really long time. Um, there's a lot of use cases for augmented reality using iPads or tablets in general. However, three years ago, I was really blown away by um, 
different types of goggles and I have explored around HoloLens mostly. And I had so many ideas um, and use cases and I was gonna use it for everything until I realized how many challenges are still out there. Uh, the biggest challenge in construction is actually field of view. I can't tell you how many times I would explain and um, go over this cool application we developed for the customer and we would put goggles on customers' head and ask them, how's the view? And I would hear back, not good. I see only this little window in front of me. Um, so for like design review, when you work in really big hospitals and trying to make decisions on different operating rooms, it's very important to get a really feel of the room using these types of technology. Unfortunately, it was still pretty limited that way. Another big aspect um, in safety is obviously hard hat. Three years ago, nobody was making hard hats for different headsets. We have been really creative, we used some Velcro, we have used 3D printed clips, and it's been challenging um, to make it comfortable and make our craft workers to wear it for a long period of time. Also, and, um, any type of goggles need to be ANSI cert certified uh, to use in a field. And also, Mortensen requires uh, foam lining on glasses. So that tells you how much upfront and modification we need to do in order to test any type of application in the field. So do you, do you feel like um, it seems like there was a whole bunch of broad spectrum of types of projects that you started with and you identified areas that, you know, is challenging because you might have a new worker that needs to, you know, use a headset or you have to wear a safety helmet or these considerations are challenging. Have you been able to narrow them down now to say here's a few use cases that make sense um, for these types of specific workers? Is that is that something that you've kind of gone through that journey now and being able to identify those ones that would be successful? Uh, correct, yes. Um, we still use augmented reality for design quite a bit because it's just easy um, and provide our, provide our customers with a really good experience and um, it's a lot more friendly than virtual reality. Um, Technology is not quite there, in my opinion, to use it in the field. Um, connectivity could be another um, a breaking point to use uh, augmented reality in the field. However, there's a lot of opportunity to use these technologies uh, for quality control, maintenance, and also remote assist. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Sean, I know you have uh, some thoughts on kind of the challenges <laughs> that you went through in the different use cases, so love to hear those. Sure. Oh. Sure, mine is, uh, I'll take a completely different perspective. Uh, this is more around the IT of it um, and the software world. So yes, the business identifies the use case and everything is ready. Now when it comes to the actual uh, technology or the product selection, how does that go? That's where um, my experience like was mostly in like identifying the product and making sure it has the right integrations when it comes to the backend systems. So the number one, ch I would say it's a twofold challenge when I see there. Number one challenge is, uh, it's more towards the uh, the standard software development lifecycle challenges that you that you have, as in like uh, for example, whenever you have these applications coming in, I think I was asking the question yesterday for the panel as well. How are you making sure, as an because we have a diverse, uh, a huge IT organization which are developing and supporting these applications, then how do you make sure all of these uh, developers or the application developers in here? are keeping up with the dependency of the libraries and also the SDK updates that are coming our way. How do you make a call that, when do you make and refactor your applications uh, whenever these are appearing and versus not? That's a huge, huge thing for us in the enterprise setup. And the second thing is in the same lines, like, okay, fine, you have your applications, but before you roll out to the user base, how are you making sure you are doing the stress testing and the performance testing? Because this shouldn't be any different from any other application developments that you do. Um, and on the same lines, it's it's about like how quickly can you go ahead and roll back your changes from the devices once you think it's not the right application or some bug is found in there. These are really critical. Um, I mean, at some use cases, this might not be needed on day one for a small pilots, but if you're talking about the use cases where you are putting a pharmacist or any other critical use cases which require certain SOX compliances for the enterprise standpoint, this need to be available on day one. So uh, when we evaluate or look at the uh, 
of the shelf applications these are some things that we clearly look at like does it support have support for all of this and does it have the integration with our mdm systems so that's that's more on one fold of the challenges that we see when i say challenges again it's more could be our processes as well but at the same time we want to make sure these are available before we make a selection on that this on the other side i think this is more around the um i would say yes you have the applications built in and all now it's more around the integration and the security challenges that we see uh, when I say the integration security, it's more around like there are, I can see at a very high level from a developer perspective, two, two set of use cases. One is one of one, applications which run on your wearables or the devices stand alone just with the internet connection, no, no, no connection required whatsoever to the core networks or the core systems. That's one set of applications. But on the other side, there are set of applications which would be needing a real time connection back into the backend systems or your ERP systems. That's where we see a lot of challenges at this day. Uh, reason being, uh, not necessarily every, you, you don't have a cookie cut solution where somebody provides you something and you hook your applications in there and it starts communicating back. That's not going to be uh, feasible. However, uh, I mean, what we have seen is like they, they think that this is how the enterprise systems work and they build the solutions, but that's not necessarily be true when you come to the real world. Uh, so what happens is we need to have some sort of an uh, orchestrator or some sort of an APIs available to go ahead and integrate with whatever is the system that the enterprises support. Um, that's really important because uh, even in the enterprise world, today we have one ERP system and down the lane we might be moving into something else. So you need to be ready from the application standpoint to go ahead and integrate into all of these because we, during the product evaluations, I see one team, uh, when we were choosing a product, they were readily available to integrate with one of our core systems. But we were in the migration of moving it to another system, and they were not ready for it. So that was a deal breaker for us. So I would say these are some challenges that we see in an enterprise setup. But it's that doesn't mean um, we should we we can't do anything around it. There will be work that needs to be done around it, but it's not, not going to be easily available for you. Though. Those are some things. And again, uh, I think the most important thing that I forgot to mention was the, the authentication and the authorization aspects. We felt there was a huge challenges that we have to deal with it because uh, usually we wouldn't let any of our, any of the systems or the calls call, cross our network boundaries unless you perform some two-factor two, two authentication. In this case, how do you make sure your applications are doing the AD authentication, getting the tokens, and then sending it off to the uh, two-step uh, verification system and getting those back? This is a standard, pretty standard setup for us because we wanted to safeguard our systems there. But how do you make sure these are all readily available in the applications as well so it can easily fit in and we can roll out? Those are some things that we had to work on a case-by-case uh, -case basis and then make sure that we either have it readily available or build something around it. Yeah, a lot of that is around the enterprise readiness and being something that's actually going to be scalable within your organization. And, and that makes that makes lots of sense. I know for every organization, they have to, you know, one of the most important things is making sure that you involve your IT and your security um, right off the start. Uh, they, you know, from what we found in working with customers in all sorts of different industries from food service to manufacturing and industrial um, and aerospace, um, IT really doesn't like being surprised. Um, so involving them, uh, I, I mean, I think the reality is that a lot of these, um, these, these software products and companies that you see out on the floor today probably aren't completely uh, enterprise ready. I mean, they don't have everything set up as, as Sean was saying in terms of the integrations and set up with like easy connections to their, their APIs and everything else. But I think most organizations are moving towards that direction, starting with product and then saying, how do we make it so it's gonna be scalable within organizations. So it really is about setting, I think, clear, clear expectations um, connecting with your IT and security team and saying these are the challenges that we're going to have. Um, how do we put a plan in place that says let's start with something that's going to be measurable that as we move forward to the next stage we can make sure that these types of um, you know, um, advancements are going to be available to us. And, and it is about that, that open discussion. These are a lot of times at startup uh, type companies, not not all the time, of course. Some are more, you know, well funded than others. But there is that roadmap and that journey that you re really need to uh, to engage on. Um, uh, I guess moving a bit into into the use cases too. Um, you know, I'll just open it up if if anybody wants to share 
a little bit about maybe something that, that went well or, or possibly something that didn't and what you learned from it. Because I think most of this is about a learning experience for us. We're all trying to figure out the best ways to, to approach this. And I think Maria had gone through some, some good examples of areas that they found challenges. But if anyone wants to kind of join and just, you know, share some of those experiences, love to hear them. Um, <clears throat> within the healthcare sector, there are so many in my mind, so many use cases for VR, AR applications. Um, uh, we have a number of them sort of on our backlog that once we get some momentum, we'd like to tackle. One of them um, is in regards to patients. Um, we, uh, we supply a lot of specialty pharmaceuticals to very serious uh, health, to address serious healthcare issues like cancer, hepatitis, et cetera. Um, and there's a lot of uh, patient reluctance in going in to get their treatments at the appropriate clinic, et cetera. And one of the use cases that came across our, our team's desk was um, to create some sort of virtual um, orientation to the patient, going in for their first infusion or their first injection or their first treatment to kind of give them the whole experience so they're well aware of what's going to happen ahead of time. Um, so to me, that was a compelling use case that could really help patients get their treatments. Uh, another one uh, was in regard to patients as well, but this time on the corporate side, uh, customer or patient empathy. We have warehouse workers that spend their whole shift loading totes with packages and pharmaceuticals and bottles, et cetera, um, intent on achieving their, their performance goals when they're doing that, quality, speed, et cetera. But it helps if we sort of motivate them by giving them sort of some sort of training on how our patients are impacted by their work. So at Amerisource Bergen, we're all about the patient. Even though we're in logistics, we're in healthcare supply chain and services, it's all about getting the right medicine to the right patient at the right time, safely and securely. And if we can use this technology to help uh, our workers understand that more fully, even, either showing them a day in the life of a cancer patient or maybe a day in the life of an independent retail pharmacist that has to tell an elderly lady that comes in every week for her pain medications that her medication didn't come today because Amerisource Bergen screwed up. So it's that kind of thing that I think kind of drives us to use this technology from a personal perspective. Um, but the one case that we actually are using um, is to help the productivity of our warehouse workers. So um, we're doing a training uh, VR scenario to actually help uh, orient new uh, hires into the pick, pack, and ship process. The, uh, the turnover uh, in the distribution center in industry is pretty high, so we always have new hires you know, every week. And traditionally, we would pull experienced workers off the line in order to work with these folks to get them up to speed and actually have them sort of in the line, almost getting in the way of other production workers. Um, but our thought is with this virtual reality training, before they even step onto the line, we can give them a pretty good experience of what it's going to be like. And then, therefore, they can go onto the line with less disruption and with less impact to other more experienced workers' time as well. So that's the use case we're concentrating on in our pilot, and, and we hope to see some, some good results from that. Yeah, I definitely think training is is sort of an easy place to start for both AR and VR. Um, it, it allows you to control the environment, so you're not really as worried about you know some of the logistics of of safety and connectivity and things like that. You can be generally offline. Um, you can place content virtually, either in in a virtual world or even in a real world that allows you to to really learn from that sort of give that experience to that worker before they go in front of the equipment so that that is a that is a really great place to start um shelly i you know from your perspective now shelly was on stage yesterday talking about a lot of the kind of um uh, value that's being created through ar uh, with lockheed so you could probably go on for an hour about your use cases but instead of doing that may, maybe talk about one that um, that didn't work that well for whatever reason and what you learned from it. Is there something that, from your perspective, that you can share from that uh, angle? Well, let's see. We normally think of, of work instructions as being uh, very step-based. You have an order of steps that you're following. And when we were working with the heat shield for Orion, heat shield is a structure that protects it from uh, the temperatures on re-entry. Um, I think it's up to 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's half the temperature of the sun. Um, it keeps the inside 72 degrees for the astronauts, but it's critical 
but it's uh, manufactured uh, very cautiously. And with that one, we saw that the technicians were needing to work in a manner that was not exactly step-based. Um, they would work uh, based on availability of people and components in different areas. And so we needed a way to set up the instruction where they could navigate easily, but where um, they didn't have to follow step A, B, C. Um, we were able to do that. We, we set up ways for them to navigate very quickly using highlight spheres um, that were labeled that they could select, almost like seeing layers of data. Um, that worked out very well after we structured it, but at, at the start, um, it was a challenge for them to navigate the data. Um, but sometimes we have to take a creative approach to um, unique scenarios like that. And then in terms of use cases, there's, uh, you know, like you say, there's many, many that we're looking at. Um, we're interested in using eye tracking and EEG along with devices to determine levels of intent. So if you think of training a person in a step and then being able to tell through the sensing of the device when they perform the step, are they certain? Are they somewhat certain? Are they not certain with their action? Um, we can give technicians or um, employees tests, but we don't know when they're guessing with traditional methods. With the technology that's available today with um, AR and eye tracking and EEG, we might be able to tell uh, the levels of intent. Yeah, I know, I know Lockheed's taken the approach of being, um, to use the word creative, very iterative, you know, in terms of saying this is the use case um, and, and really quickly identifying what the challenges are with that. But instead of just being like, oh, this doesn't work because there's too many problems, you've taken the approach of, okay, how do we adapt what we're doing? How do we make small changes to it to put it into a way that's going to be successful? And I think that's been one of the keys to your, you know, your success with your teams. Um, uh, Maria, what, if you were starting today with, uh, you know, somebody right now or maybe a project that you're just put, putting in place, is there something that you can say from your experiences, this is how we're approaching it moving forward, for example? Um, sure. Um, I have two examples I would like to share. Um, in construction, it's very important to understand that safety is the, the biggest thing. Also time. Everyone wants to build faster and safer, right? Uh, so there's two huge opportunities in AR world for construction is prefabrication. So there's a lot of uh, examples we have where we go through a lot of development and everyone who develop an application for AR knows how complicated it can get, especially when you deal with a lot of um, different models or you maybe you're dealing with one model that is really complex. Um, so if you go through all the steps developing your application, you want to make sure people use it and use it on different stages of construction. So fabrication, prefabrication is one of those opportunities when you can utilize the same model over and over. Um, in the beginning, we utilize it for design review and make sure our customers are on the same page with us. We make sure uh, sequencing is right. And then we can utilize the same model for installation where any craft worker can just put goggles on and don't have to take any measurements or look at any drawings. They can virtually align what they see in the field um, with like physical objects. And at the end, we utilize the same model again for quality control. Any engineer without much experience can actually identify if things don't align right. And there's a lot of other um, applications for like maintenance with the same model as well. So that was a really good case um, for construction, but also we have done some projects that have been like really challenging. Like currently I'm working on developing uh, AR application for uh, concrete pour inspection. Um, I'm working in a really large hospital and we would like to, um, preview a future pour a day before the next day we can perform quality control and make sure all the sleeves and all the components in the wall and then um, move on to the next pour. So when you use um, uh, any type of like goggles outside, 
there are like a whole bunch of new challenges. Tracking is one of them. Um, security, number two. Also another big one, unless you try to use goggles outside, you don't really think of it, is sun glare. It's been a big challenge for us. Yeah, for sure. Identifying those those areas that, that are challenging and saying, okay, well, instead of these use cases, look, let's focus on the ones that are indoors. And I know from our own experience, working in the quality assurance and inspection side of the construction is is definitely an area that uh, that there's tremendous opportunity in because you're taking some of those factors um, out of that out of that way. So, um, it, you know, and, and moving on to a little bit about how you do it, uh, we'll kind of try and go through this quickly. So we've got a bit of time for uh, for questions. But content, I mean, content is is a whole bunch of things. Content can be um, videos or photos. It can be annotations. It, I mean, it could even be audio files or it could be fully rich animated step-by-step uh, -step instructions. And there's a whole bunch of different ways to approach content from creating content on your own to, um, you know, having software that allows you to do that. Um, you know, from, from Walmart's perspective, how, how do you approach the content side? Is it something that you look at doing internally or uh, do you evaluate software? How do you see it moving forward? Sure. Uh I'm going to add a little, I'm not um, well versed or I do not work closely with the content creation team, but uh, based on my experience has been like, it's it's a mix of it. Number one is oh, I, our teams closely look at what type of a content are we building? Is this going to be proprietary for Walmart specifically? Then yes, we do have our own uh, 3D cam cam, 3D cam building teams who work on that specifically. It's across for all the Walmart. Um, but also at the same time, if this is like building the training content, as long as um, the vendor who is knowing what exactly the training that we are going to do, if he is aware of it, he is the one who is going to be building the content and making sure it's kept up to date and everything on it. So it's both. But on the other side, there is also something that our teams are looking at, the 3D scans, wherein if you want to get high fidelity and then and minute details of some appliances or anything that, that goes in the Walmart stores, like kitchen or any of those appliances, then yes, um, there is also this extreme end of where we use this software to actually 3D scan it and then build the content. So I would say it's it's all extremes, but there is also something what, what in my personal experience has been the content that you build and render real time, as in like uh, we were working on a use case of uh, data visualization uh, on in HoloLens for, a, for an executive wherein he, is, he would be able to see all the store level information and then reporting of it, and that would be rendered as a 3D model on real time. That's a different kind of content that we are talking here. But uh, we had a lot of challenges in building that because it drains your battery easily. Like within less than an hour, we were able, uh, because you're talking about a regional level and the market level store information, getting into the product level and seeing what product was sell for what, that's huge tons of data then. Then you are trying to use the data and, co and construct some 3D models around that and then show, visualize them. That's Those are some things that we have to be really cha um, um, uh, taking care of. Like how do you minimize the rendering processing? So again, I would say content is wide and depends on what type of content you're choosing. There's a different approach our team's gonna be taking. So. Yeah, so not really one one approach. It's kind of dependent on the use case and whether the content's internal, it's built external, who owns it. I mean, this conversation is going to be very different five years from now, as we just heard about, obviously, how um, extensive 5G networks are getting and cloud computing and cloud rendering and not worrying about, you know, necessarily polygon count and everything else as much. Um, maybe I'll just ask Shelly for one more comment on the on the content side, and then we can get into some, uh, some Q&A. So how, how does Lockheed, is it, is it a combination of internal plus external, or what is, what is the strategy, I guess, moving forward? It's primarily internal for content. Um, we use products externally, but um, for content in terms of pre-existing, I mean, we have programs that are have been decades. Uh, we've worked, um, we have other programs that are new. Um, there's different requirements of different across different programs. Um, some of the older programs don't have 3D modeling. Um, all of the more current ones do, but in some cases, those programs model only the space flight content, so the test equipment is not modeled. What we're finding is that um, there's enough value in modeling the test equipment that it makes sense to do so uh, because of the return on investment in using AR in test. So for example, strain gauges, when we place and clock strain gauges um, in the past, they did not add that content to the models. 
Um, now they're making it a standard process to add that to the models because it saves so much time when they're installing and marking the locations and clocking. Um, we typically find that if we're pulling over uh, traditional products into AR, in some cases we lose the value of AR. Um, there's incredible value of placing content in the environment. That's the value of AR and MR. Um, in, in some cases, we still pull pictures and video in into that wearable view, but um, the power in overlaying content within the true environment is really, I think, where we see the most benefit. Right. Um, great. Well, thank you. I think we have about five minutes left, so maybe what we'll do is uh, open it up to questions from the floor. Hi, I'm Ann Miller from Raytheon, and my question is for Shelly. Um, we also have um, similar issues in terms of being able to convert legacy documents into the AR, VR um, technology. What are the things that you've done in order to be able to do that efficiently? When you show the ROI, a lot of times that helps drive the interest from the many layers that you have to get approvals from in order to convert the content. Um, another element is when you replace products with AR. There, there's two approaches. One is to supplement traditional products with AR. The other is to replace it. When you replace with AR, um, of course, we have all the products that we deliver to our customers uh, many times in paper format that's stamped, a physical stamp in traditional methods. Um, they must be willing to receive content in a new version if we're replacing. So in the earlier stages, the approach we took was to supplement um, because we could still deliver products in the traditional format um, that they were comfortable with. And then as that uh, grew and uh, gained interest, then it opens up a discussion to replace with AR. I think that's a good point too, and I, it's a conversation that I have all the time. Um, is that you know a, a potential customer will say, "Well, we have so much content, so many instructions, thousands of procedures. We just can't possibly imagine putting it all into AR or or VR, or whatever it might be." And and they're absolutely right. I mean that that would take an enormous amount of time. But the conversation needs to be where can we start, right? What is the one use case? What is the one set of instructions? What is the one area that we can identify that there's something measurable that you're going to be able to save some time on and some money on? Because you can start to expand from there. It doesn't need to be everything to everybody. There's going to be the naysayers that say you can't do it because there's no way you could apply it in every area of the business, and, and they're right. But there's a starting point, and it allows you to expand from there. So focus on where you can start, not on areas that you can't. Um, next, any other questions? And one quick question, I'm wondering how you think about Ron Bellows, Risk Retention Bureau. I'm wondering how you consider cybersecurity when you transfer and go from traditional programs and plans into AR, VR. I can take the question. Um, when it comes to cybersecurity, um, there are certain, I mean, when it comes to Walmart, at least uh, from our perspective, whenever we have a use case, we actually group it into like, is it a sensitive or highly sensitive? If you're talking about training data, and uh, if, it, if we are not putting out any of our Walmart proprietary information on it, or if there is no associate personal details being shared on it, that's a different kind of an, um, data or use cases altogether versus something else wherein you have use cases wherein you have some proprietary data going in there. So th this is one level of, um, uh, I mean, this is how we tackle saying that what level of security should we be uh, enforcing on these applications? That's number one. And then when coming to the actual um, security or from the um, networking layer itself, because number one in the cybersecurity for us is anything that has to come into the Walmart perimeter should be, as I mentioned, like authorized and authenticated, and it should be proper working or coming in from the approved devices itself. That's one level of uh, security that you are enforcing. Also making sure the content that you're sharing out there, even the telemetry that you're talking about, because we quite a times we talk about metrics, like 
how do we make sure that uh, the, whatever is the gaze that you're looking at or whatever is the information of the associate that is logging in, you're all logging into your telemetry, into back into your cloud systems. That is also going to be key for us. We need to make sure that is also encrypted at rest and uh, encrypted during the transmission and whatnot. So for us, uh, when we look at cybersecurity for these applications, uh, it's 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 going to be exactly the same that we would be doing in another, be it be a mobile application development or another web application, that wouldn't be any different. We would be making sure that it is following those uh, gu guidelines that we have put in place based on the severity of the, of the application and the data in there. Awesome. Probably time for another question or two. I think there's somebody up here. The, the question is around uh, adoption and user experience as you're sort of changing and evolving into this, uh, this type of technology. How did they approach that internally within their organizations? So it's very important how you approach the end users at the very start. Um, you can have end users who are resistant or you can have end users who are incredibly excited to employ the technology. And the way that you approach them from the beginning um, can drive that culture. Um, we always want to keep our end users in mind with what we're developing. Um, we initially thought we knew what they would need. Um, we reached out to them to see if that aligned, and they went a completely different direction. So I don't need it for the entire uh, instruction. I need it for this part of the instruction. And we went back and we accommodated that and they saw that they were able to shape um, the solution. And then they also provided feedback very early on on requests of additional capabilities. And we were very fortunate with the tech partners we had that they would help us uh, develop that type of solution. Um, and then they see that they're shaping that solution for the broader use across uh, the business area or the corporation. Um, then you have allies instead of resistant end users. Um, I think that's very important in the early stages to get started the correct way. Um, you want to find the right groups to start with. And there have been times where we've held off on deploying um, onto the shop floor in order to find the right groups to start with. Michael, from a little bit more kind of early days, is there any perspective you have have on that as well in terms of the uh, adoption and, and getting people excited about it? Um, I would say the the actual users um, that we've encountered are very excited about it. Um, the, uh, the one caveat is um, that uh, whatever we do doesn't disrupt current performance. So there's a concern about that. Um, we have uh, industrial engineers that time all the movements of all of our warehouse workers and they have to perform within a certain range of that standard in order to meet their productivity goals. If they don't meet it, they get docked. If they do exceed it, they get rewarded. So whatever we do, has, we have to make sure that uh, we impact, but in a positive way. Um, so a lot of our um, measurement, a lot of our concerns during this pilot is going to be to take appropriate measurements to make sure that we don't disrupt productivity um, and that in fact we do uh, enhanced productivity. That was one of the reasons why we chose one of the most important uh, pick, pack, and, and ship SOPs, um, because if we're going to do this, we want to make sure that we can have a, a positive impact. But other than that, I would say uh, most people are generally excited to be part of something new, and I, I think we can use that uh, as momentum to carry forward and get broader adoption as we move forward. Yeah, that's great to hear. Um, with that, I think we're probably out of time, so uh, thank you very much to to my fellow panelists here, I appreciate that. And uh, thank you very much for your time here today as well.